Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm starting a new series and this is going to be a little bit different from my normal material. I have frequently made reference to the plethora of evidence that is out there regarding evolution and how we know that evolution is a fact that is then explained by the theory of evolution. So in this series I will do a deeper dive than I normally would into the different lines of evidence that support the theory of evolution. First though, some housekeeping. I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. When I announced that I would be doing two videos per week, I did not clarify for patrons that the second video would be posted with no charge. I am only going to be charging patrons for the videos that I post on Thursdays. I have also not decided whether or not I'm going to give patrons early access to this series, as I'm kind of flying by the seat of my pants here, and I don't want to promise something that I can't deliver. Also, I know there are some people in my audience that really enjoyed the Rhinews segment, and I enjoyed making it, but I think it was a bit out of my depth at the moment. I would like to have everything planned out and ready in advance, so the whole process of scheduling meetings with people who sometimes need to change their schedule at the last minute, and coordinating time zones, and editing sometimes more than two hours of content down to a less than one hour video all on the day that it's supposed to go live just ended up being a little bit much for me. I do hope to pick it up and continue it in the future, perhaps once I get more settled into this new schedule that I'm doing, but for the moment, it's on hiatus. So, okay, now that that's out of the way, on to the video! I thought I'd start things off with some of the basics. So today's video is on homology and analogy. I'm sure most of my audience will have memories of high school biology class and the classic diagram of the four limbs of the tetrapods presented as a prime example of homology. And that really is a prime example, so that's going to be our starting point. There is more to homology than just a loose similarity between different animals. It's about the basic structure. When comparing the bones of different tetrapods' forelimbs, we always see one single arm bone going from the shoulder, or the shoulder equivalent, down to the elbow. At the elbow, it connects to a pair of bones that go down the forearm to the wrist. In the wrist, there is a close grouping of distinct carpal bones, which then connect to the metacarpals and finally to the phalanges. This isn't just us looking at bones that have similar shapes and giving them the same name. It is the fact that the ones with the similar shapes are always connected to each other, in the exact same order, every time. There are no tetrapods with a radius and ulna combination on the upper arm and a single humerus style bone below it. It is always shoulder, humerus, radius and ulna, then the carpals. They come in many different shapes and sizes, but always in the exact same order. This process of specific bone connections is most stark at the limbs, but it can be traced throughout the whole body. And what's more, the closer we are related to another organism, the more similar the bone structure will be. Because changes do happen, additions and subtractions do occur, but the overall plan is the same, and the order of the connections is the same. For instance, all vertebrates have tails, every single one, including you. Your tail is just a stumpy little bone called the coccyx, though. Nothing to get excited about. Though it does start out as a bona fide tail in the uterus before the vertebrae fuse together into the coccyx. So unless you have a rare atavism, it stays under the skin. Do you know which other vertebrates have a stumpy little coccyx? The ones that seem to be our closest relatives when looking at other lines of evidence, like genetics. Specifically, the great apes. None of them have external tails, but they all have stubby little internal tails. Go a little further back, and you'll find that all mammals have the same three bones in their inner ears that if you trace them through embryonic development, they originate in a structure that forms the jawbones and lizards. So it's not just that structures are similar that cause us to use homology as evidence for evolution. It is the fact that you can group animals by their homologous structures, and these groupings show a nested hierarchy of traits that matches closely with similar groupings that were arrived at through different methods, which I will cover later. And these nested hierarchies don't just group organisms that we see today, it fits in perfectly with the fossil record. The three middle ear bones that only exist in mammals also only exist in mammalian fossils until you go back in time far enough you reach lizard-like creatures that have mammalian characteristics, among them the three ear bones. Now these particular critters existed about 260 million years ago. If we go back another 40 million years you get our common ancestor with birds. Birds have a very different system in place for hearing, but there are some similarities that are homologous, and this is where things get a little bit complicated, because if you remember I had mentioned that we don't just look at things that are superficially similar, give them the same name, and then declare them homologous. But at this point we run into the snag of having the same names for structures that are not homologous. 
The development of the tympanic membrane, for instance, didn't happen until after the lines that led to birds and mammals have separated from each other. So these are two structures that have the same function and look similar, with the same name, but they are not declared homologous, because we are not just looking to show relatedness between every organism, we're looking to find out the actual degree of relatedness between organisms. Pretending that things are homologous when they are not is not helpful in this endeavor. And that brings us to analogous traits. We can also tell when two features are analogous rather than homologous, meaning that they serve the same function or have similar appearance, but do not share ancestry. Looking at the comparison of the mammalian and avian auditory systems, there are some aspects of them that are homologous, but others that are analogous. But the auditory system gets rather complicated, so I'll bring it back to the forelimbs, specifically the wings. Wings are a mixture of homology and analogy, as most things actually are when you do a deep dive on their evolutionary history. Looking at specifically tetrapod wings and ignoring the insect wings for now, they have the same bone structure all connected in the same order, but flight developed after the lineages that led to our modern flying animals diverged from each other. Now how do we know this? Because the wings themselves are not homologous, even though the bone structures are. They accomplish the same purpose using the same bone structure, but in drastically different ways. The bat has a hand with elongated fingers, which then stretch out a membrane to form the wing. A bird has feathers extending from the back of the arm. Going back further, you can see pterosaur wings, which stretch a membrane from an elongated pinky finger all the way down to its ankles. Same bone structure, but different solutions for how flight would develop. This is also known as convergent evolution. Convergent evolution happens when the selection pressures of an environment strongly favor a particular trait, so that trait will develop more than once. Flight is useful, so it evolved at least four times. Bats, birds, pterosaurs, and insects. Insects don't have bones in their wings, which you probably already knew, and since they don't have any internal skeleton to speak of, they don't fit into the homology described by the skeleton. Now, going on to another trait, sight. Sight is useful, so it evolves several times. There are possibly more than 50 independent lines of evolution that led to various types of eyes. And even this depends on where we draw the line for divergence. It is possible that some basic form of photosensitivity developed very early on, and that all eyes share this basic homology, but built on it in different ways. So if we are just looking at the ability to sense photons, that trait could be said to be homologous between most, if not all, animals that have any sort of light sensitivity today. But then when we look at the details, we can see fundamental differences in how they go about sensing and processing light. Vertebrate eyes are very different from cephalopod eyes, which are very different from other mollusk eyes, which are very different from insect eyes, etc. So we know that vertebrates and cephalopods did most of their eye development independently from each other. We can tell this by examining the various structures. In particular, the photoreceptor cells in both lineages are facing opposite directions, with vertebrate photoreceptors facing the back of the eye and cephalopod photoreceptors facing the lens. This is a development that would have had to happen very early on, and as evolution has no final goals, there wouldn't necessarily have been a disadvantage to having the photoreceptors facing backward early on, and there was no plan to deal with the problems that would crop up as a result of this, uh, let's call it a mistake, when more complex eyes developed. So now all vertebrates have a blind spot where the optic nerve that carries the information from the photoreceptors to the brain has to pass through the retina in order to get that information to the brain for processing. Though if you want to get technical, our eyes are basically physical extensions of our brain that are exposed on our face. Bit of a weird thought, but it is true. Also worth noting here is the nautilus eye. This is another example of evolutionary biologists not just finding similarities and declaring them homologous for the sake of making everything fit their predetermined notions of evolution, but rather investigating and changing their conclusions based on new information. There are two living clades within cephalopoda, the coleoids and the nautiloids, with the nautiloids being represented by one single genus, the nautilus, and the coleoids being the, all the rest of them, the squids, cuttlefish, octopuses, etc. The nautiloids have a very different eye from the coleoids. Their eyes are basically like a pinhole camera with no lens or cornea. The nautilus is also what's known as a living fossil, that is, a currently extant creature that is very similar, at least superficially, to its ancestors' form millions of years ago. The logical conclusion of these differences is that the coleoid cephalopods diverged from the nautiloids before the development of the lens and the cornea, which allowed them to develop more sophisticated eyes and left the poor nautiloids in the dust.
But fairly recent research has determined that this is not likely the case. A genetic examination and comparison of nautilus and pygmy squid embryos has determined that the nautilus has the necessary genes for producing the cornea and lens, but these genes are just not expressed in the same way as for the coleoids. This suggests that their ancestors did have eyes similar to the coleoid cephalopods, but at some point in the past lost the ability to grow a lens or cornea, providing a good example of divergent evolution where one feature changes in different ways over time in several different lineages. Now, I have drastically oversimplified the process by which we determine whether or not different structures are homologous. There's genetic analysis, statistical analysis, protein analysis, there's debate within the scientific community, and eventually they do come to a consensus, usually. I've used examples that are so obvious that it's easy for someone with no training to see, but as I've been researching the matter, I keep coming across papers and articles that go into great detail on which individual proteins are homologous between which organisms, and how the variants of these individual proteins developed independently in other organisms and whatnot. In looking into the eye, the protein crystallin, which is the transparent protein that makes up the lens of the eye, I found that it has at least 89 variants that are found in humans alone, and they vary in length from being as short as 26 amino acids to 34,350. And within the human body, some of these crystallins are active enzymes, while others are inactive, but they have been determined to be somewhat homologous to other active enzymes. So within our own body, we have structures that are homologous to other structures in our body, which itself is a bit of a mind bender, but it makes sense in light of evolution. After all, the idea is that all of our structures evolved from something that existed already in the past, but in the case of something like a protein, there isn't necessarily a reason to stop producing the previous version once a new version develops, so we can see both versions being actively produced by the body now. To conclude, homology and analogy are not determined arbitrarily based on what scientists determined in advance must have been the case. Different structures are carefully studied, data is collected, and then analyzed, and then based on this observable data, structures are classified as homologous or analogous. And by using this data, organisms can be placed in categories based on how closely homologous their structures are, and these categories match up very closely with other methods for grouping organisms together, and it shows degrees of relatedness. Homology alone is excellent evidence for evolution, but it is not alone. Join me next week as we look at the evidence for evolution found in embryology. For early access to my Friday videos, consider becoming a patron. You can also follow me on social media or donate through PayPal. Links to all of that are in the description. See you next time!